Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, Page One Power webinar. My name is Mike Bryant. Happy to have you with us um, today. We are excited to uh, share with you a special presentation um, from John Henshaw of Raven Tools. Uh, he's going to be uh, sharing with us tips, tricks, advice, and just overall teaching on on-page SEO. And uh, let's get into uh, the details. Broadcasting live today from Boise, Idaho. That's the Page One Power headquarters. Uh, we saw our first snow, so it is slick and super cold. Uh, how about you? Feel free to use the uh, questions tab to share information, uh, questions throughout the webinar. Um, also over on Twitter, uh, use that hashtag P1P webinar. Uh, we love the extended com conversation that takes place. Uh, we've got our uh, one of our uh, chief content writers, Andrew Dennis. He will be live tweeting throughout and answering any questions you want to throw over there. But Save your best questions for the uh, live Q&A that's going to take place at the end of the presentation. So uh, that's myself. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And I'm the event coordinator here at Page One Power. Um, I uh, set up all the uh, webinars and trade shows and conferences. And our guest today, John Hinshaw. Hello, John. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. Uh, happy to have you with us. Uh, for those of you who don't know John, he's the president and co-founder of Raven Internet Marketing Tools and a fantastic source for SEO knowledge of all kinds. Uh, but John, would you mind giving us just a little bit of background on your career in SEO? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I'm old enough where I, I grew up without the internet. <laughs> and uh, in college is when the internet kind of came into being and that's when I started to um, play around with building websites and and uh, I've been doing this since about 94 or 95 and uh, and it's been an interesting ride ever since uh, I've I've had a bunch of little companies I've worked in, a, in several different areas the most recent thing I was doing before I started Raven was I was an interaction designer at Visa, and I was working on their uh, consumer and, and business uh, facing sites, and and then uh, really had always had a love of SEO. I've been doing SEO for at least 12, 13 years, and uh, and that kind of led into the creation of of Raven. We were doing our own agency work and started building some of our own tools. Then we started kind of giving them away some of the early tools and, and people really felt, found them helpful too. And, and, and then uh, it just kind of evolved into what is now Raven today, which is this marketing platform, uh, particularly for reporting that agencies and in-house people use. And then uh, one of the things I'll be going over today, which is kind of my baby and my favorite tool, which is our site auditor, which which automatically will analyze any site and tell you all of the optimization opportunities, all the things that are broken that you may need to fix. Uh, and so that's it's been an interesting journey. But I, you know, Raven's been around for about a decade now, which is kind of blows me away. Uh, we're kind of one of the earlier SEO software companies out there, and uh, and so that that is uh, that's what I've been doing, and that is my passion, and and I I. I can many times be found on weekends just testing and tweaking and building new blogs and, and trying out new techniques. And so one of the things I'll be going over today are all the things that I consider to be modern uh, SEO methods and, and techniques that, uh, from an on-page perspective that work, that are important, that everybody should be doing. And so that'll be the, the main thing that I'll be sharing with everybody. Well, fantastic. Um... Before we get started, I'm just going to push out a quick poll to the audience uh, just to get a feel for who's joining us. Um, and uh, let me pull that up right now. We'll just spend about 30 seconds on that. So what best uh, describes your role um, in SEO? Um, 
we're looking, uh, you know, we, we usually get a pretty good mix of freelance, in-house, and agency employees. But it's always interesting to, to just gauge each individual audience uh, to see if there's any spikes. And it looks like uh, agency is kind of uh, taking the cake today. Um, I'll give that 15 more seconds. Keep the answers coming in. Let us know where you're coming from. And we'll go ahead and close that. So it looks like 53% agency, 28% in-house, and 19% of freelancers. So uh, I'm going to share uh, screen controls over to you now, John, and right. uh, if you're ready to go. Yeah, let's do it. Go. All right. So should have got the invite there. All right, get this going. Looks good. All right, so let's get this going. <laughs> well, thanks uh, everybody for coming. Uh, it looks like a really nice turnout. Uh, it's it's good to see uh, all the different people here. Uh, good to know that a lot of agencies that are are kind of looking for help around this area too. Uh, so I think uh, everybody will get a lot of really good things out of this. Throughout my presentation. I will give a bunch of links, and so what I do is I, I use a URL shortener, so it's raven.link, uh, and then basically where it says copy this, that's that's what you'll want to write down, uh, just in case I move through too fast or you're unable to get it, that'll help you uh, write that down quickly. Hey John, uh, let me hold up real quick. Um, we had your screen and then it clicked off, so I'm going to just switch uh, switch it back on and off presenter controls. Okay. We can get uh, go to webinar to um, cooperate with us today. So appreciate your patience, everybody, um, and appreciate uh, Heather for letting us know. There it is. I can see it now. It looks like when you went full screen is that's that's when it disappeared on us. Yep. Okay. So I'm not sure how. Um, I think we're okay. Are we okay right now? I can see the presentation with the preview tiles on the left side. Okay. I don't know how to hide those, but can you see the raven.link copy this? Um, I'm looking at uh, how to fix and optimize all things. Okay. Let's see. Here we go. There we go. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. No, that would be right. that would be pre that's presenter error. <laughs> that's how it goes. We we've been there before. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, now that you can see it, uh, use a URL shortener called Raven dot link, uh, and then where it says copy this, that's what you will want to write down, and and you just kind of add it to that URL shortener, and it will take you there. I also. Uh, use WordPress a lot, which most of us do, and so I'll include several plugins that will relate to some of the things I'm going over. And instead of just saying, you know, WordPress plugin, you'll see the icon there, and you'll you'll know uh, that is a link to a WordPress plugin. So, all right, let's get into this. Now, when I approach SEO today, it doesn't matter what it is. As soon as I uh, am handed a new site or I'm going to work on a new site, the uh, very first thing that I do, uh, which is really one of the reasons why we, we built this, is I do an automated site audit. And so there, you know, there are different ones out there. Uh, obviously, I recommend uh, ours, uh, which is our own site auditor. And what it does is it will go and crawl your entire site, and it will find automatically all of the issues and problems and places where you uh, can optimize your site that you may not be aware of, and it and it does it over. You know, thousands of pages if that's the size of your site and gives you that in a really efficient way. So when I get those results, the very first thing that I do is I look, I look at all the things that are critical. And and I'll, I'm about to go over the ones that are most important to me. Uh, some of them might surprise you as far as 
you think that's critical, and and I and I do think they're critical, and I'll explain why. Uh, the first one is actually something that we'll probably be able to agree on, and and that is making sure that you're looking at uh, any type of errors within robots.txt, um, in particular, no index, which shows up on different pages. And the reason why is because uh, it is the most common reason. Why you why you may not have pages or your entire site isn't in the index, and I've been doing this long enough that uh, I would say that the majority of visibility issues that uh, have ever been presented with almost always go back to something wrong with either the robots file or having no index in their particular files. It, this this can happen uh, in different ways. Uh, one is there are particular services where they will auto-generate a robots.txt file if you don't have it. And in the past, with one particular service, they would actually disallow by default until you made a robots.txt uh, file. And so the, that's one potential reason. Another one is when you're doing a, a redesign uh, or uh, in, in some, and basically your developer doesn't want that to be indexed, but then when you move it over to the live site, they forgot to actually change that or, or remove that. Uh, that is a very common one. Uh, another one is with CMS mis misconfiguration. And, and so it is getting easier and easier to uh, screw up your pages, particularly with the no index on the pages, with plugins, um, including even uh, the one I recommend for SEO, Yoast plugin. Uh, the, if you, somebody else or even yourself at some point can actually go in and, and set a particular setting and you don't realize you did that or you forgot you did it and now you have uh, complete categories and pages that have no index on there. Uh, so, and then the last one, which is my favorite and, and actually one of the more common ones, which is just human failure and catastrophic human failure. Uh, somebody just doing something stupid. But regardless, that's where you need to look and, and that's where you need to fix it. The Next thing I look at are my broken pages, and, uh, and you want to fix them in general just because it's going to offer uh, a, better, a better user experience, and, and it might end up identifying things that are wrong with your site or the server you're on. Um, however, what I want to focus on are four or four pages, and and the main reason is because that is what you're going to find the most. If you run an automated site audit, you're most likely going to get a ton of 404 pages. If you go to uh, Google's Search Console and and you look at the page errors, again, you're going to see a lot of 404 page errors. However, contrary to what might be popular belief, you don't have to fix your 404s. Your your 404s are are made to let you know that something's up, but it doesn't mean you're going to be uh, penalized or your site's going to be hurt by it, uh, but it does mean that you need to review it and see if you do need to take some, some action on it. And so uh, the main reasons for that are going to be for in case somebody's come along or even there's a technical error and pages have been removed. Uh, the, the other one has to do uh, is if there are uh, high authority, trustworthy links that are linking into those particular pages and now it's gone, that's not a great thing either because you don't want to lose that. Uh, and then the last one would have to do with if a particular page is missing uh, but there is content that is still relevant on that site, then you're going to want to set something up and, and redirect over there. So uh, that's, that's where you actually would want to fix those. Now, Sometimes you can't find that content. It has been destroyed <laughs> and never to be found again. Uh, when that happens to me, and I can't, there's no local copy, I, I can't find that, the very first place I like to go to is the Wayback Machine, uh, which is archive.org, and it does that. And, and so I go there, and that's where I try to find it. And, and typically, if your site has been around or your content has been up for uh, at least a few months or several months, you can find that content there, and, and that is a nice trick in case uh, you don't have a copy of it and it's been deleted. Now, if you have relevant content on your site still, in other words, you don't want to put that content back. You, it was purposefully removed, 
but there's still something that's relevant, then what you want to do is you always want to set up a 301 redirect. And so this is example code of somebody who's running on Apache who is using an HT access file. Uh, this is what that would look like to redirect from the old page to the new relevant page or section. Now, if you're using WordPress, there's a much simpler way to do that, and that is with a plugin I recommend called Redirection, which is a free plugin, and that just makes it really easy and, and takes the place of you having to do it manually like the example before. And the, the last part is, and, and I, I want to show this because it's important, which is you can do nothing. It is completely acceptable to not fix your 404s if they don't meet the criteria that I just went over. Uh, and, and so it's okay. You are not going to be hurt on your site if a page is missing. Google's just going to be like, okay, I guess it's gone. You know, I'll keep emphasizing the, the content that still exists on your site. So the next one, and this is kind of the, uh, the ones I was talking about where is that really critical? Uh, and, and to me it is. In fact, this is one of the things that has actually been critical, I would say, near the beginning of our idea of SEO, uh, meaning it has been critical for years and years and years and years, and it's still very important. Uh, something uh, like a page title actually still has emphasis within their algorithm and how they look at your site, uh, even though it's, it still seems so simple. One of the reasons why it's important is because if you do not give a page title for your, for your pages, then Google will make one up for you, and that isn't always the best. Uh, the other reason is because it actually does still reinforce what the page content is and what the topic is for that page to, to the bot, to the algorithm. And so without that, uh, you are leaving money on the table. And, and, uh, and so that's, that's one of the biggest things uh, problems I actually see, particularly with automated templated systems, people who threw something together, they're either missing or they're all the same, and that is not good at all. And so that is one of the things I try to address uh, up front when I'm, I'm working with any type of site or, or even new site. So best practices, uh, these kind of have shifted back and forth, but, but generally today the best practice is about 60 characters or less. Uh, it, it is a smart algorithm, at least it is now, and so don't write stupid titles, don't stuff it with a bunch of keywords, make it as natural uh, for humans and bots as possible. And, and, uh, and I have this part in here, make it relate to content, which is uh, a lot of the changes that have been going on with the algorithm have been with, you don't have to say a particular keyword over and over, in fact, what you have, to, what you need to do is you need to convey uh, a relationship and context, and and so you can actually use different words and different phrases within your title, in the same way that you would do the same thing with your content, and that actually is going to reinforce uh, to Google when when you're saying basically the same thing in different ways, then it knows what you actually really mean because they're smart smart enough to do that now. The next thing that I emphasize is that you fix your internal broken links. And, uh, and basically, uh, there are many sites out there that have a lot of link rot. And the problem with that is page rank is still a thing, uh, particularly on your, on your site. And even though uh, Google in particular has been treating individual pages within your site uh, with sort of their own authority and trust, uh, it still matters from the home page and with your navigation how you link to different areas and how and even internal pages that link to other parts of your page and if you have those broken uh, one of the things that it can indicate is you might actually have a main navigation problem so for example if you have uh, written blog posts and, and other areas on your site and you've linked to a particular section or to a particular page and that's broken well if if you're using something like an automated tool and you're coming, it's coming back and going, this page or these links are all broken internally, um, that could actually be a really big problem as far as when the bot comes and crawls your site and says, oh, well, I guess there really isn't any content for these particular keywords or this particular content. Uh, so fix your broken internal links. It's very important, I mean, let alone from a, from a UX perspective. 
the tool that I really like to use on WordPress is Better Search uh, Replace Pro. So if I find that uh, there's a really important internal link that's been broken, it's something that I have used many times throughout the years, you can go here, use this, and, and it will do a really good job, fairly safe job of, of replacing that text. And it also has a, a way to uh, restore back out of something if you uh, did it incorrectly. Okay, no follow. I'm going to bring that up, which is related to this, which is uh, you, you do not and should not be using the rel nofollow attribute on any of your links that link to your own pages. And uh, it, it really comes down to, uh, it, you're, if you're doing it, you're basically telling Google, I can't trust my own pages. And, and that is not how it's intended to be used, and you shouldn't be using it that way. So uh, in, in, in most cases that we see, particularly when we've kind of done sort of an anonymous meta-analysis of, of results from our own uh, uh, tool, it's usually self-referencing comment links, which, which truly is not that big of a deal, mainly because the algorithm is smart enough to kind of know what's going on there. But uh, it's, it's when it's being used in other places and other areas that you, you don't want to have that. It's, it's most commonly added by somebody who either didn't know what they were doing or some sort of developer who th thought that's just how you kind of do things. Um, and usually it'll be in the templates as they were built, particularly for uh, different CMSs. And so you just need to get in there and get that fixed and get that taken, uh, taken out. So if you've, if you've been alive at all in the, in the past couple of years then, uh, and, and had any interest in SEO, then you know that Google is all about speed now. And, uh, and it, it is in relation to all their continued push towards mobile. And so when uh, today, when I work on any site, build any site, do anything, uh, one of my main, main priorities other than the things I just kind of talked about is how fast can I make this site? Because I'm telling you, it works in regards to um, ranking and, and organic search visibility. Uh, I have little blogs that I have built over the weekend that should not rank and should not show up for certain things and they're on the first page and they hang out between uh, position two and six and they have for several years now with some of them and, and the biggest thing I did was not build links. I just uh, did all the things and some of the things I'm about to tell you about uh, to those templates and to those site and they're just, they're super fast. They're very contextual. Um, they're very simple. They have a really good user experience. And so I can't emphasize enough that you need to be focused on speeding up everything on your site that you possibly can because it matters. And so uh, the first thing as you approach this, as you think about speeding up your site, is consolidating the code. And so what that really means is over the years we've gotten to this habit of adding tons of JavaScript and links to different CSS files and everything else in between that helps the page render. And so while it's bad enough that we're adding so many of these things, it also creates individual calls that have to be made. So the browser is actually having to pull all these different things from different places back in different files and then process. And so a really good way to speed everything up is to consolidate that. And so one of, one of the ways you could do that is by using inline CSS. Now I don't mean inline CSS, the old uh, definition of that, which is where people would uh, add style equals whatever inside of the HTML uh, elements. Uh, in this case, what I'm talking about is instead of linking to a file, put it in the head area um, so that it, it just gets included into the HTML page and compressed with that. And the same is true with JavaScript. Instead of uh, linking to tons of different uh, JavaScript files, if it makes sense to, consider putting that inline uh, on the main page. And uh, in, in the case of best practices today, you want to put that at the end of the page. And the example I'm giving here is, is actually with um, uh, the schema.org data, which I'll get into in a little bit. So caching and compressing, uh, hopefully most of you are already doing that. 
Um, uh, there are uh, different services for you can use on WordPress. Some places do it automatically. Uh, but caching and compressing is actually pretty important, and uh, you know mainly because the compression <laughs> is can be so make your file so significantly fa uh, smaller and therefore faster. And caching is great because if you're working on a CMS system that connects with the database, then uh, that will make it go faster because it doesn't have to actually look it up. The, there are some free versions of, of caching software out there. I've, I've used everything basically under the sun. The WP Rocket is not a free version, but it is the simplest and the best out there that I have used so far. Uh, it's, it is the quickest to get up and running. Uh, I've had issues with uh, the other ones. Um, this is one I haven't, so I'm, I've actually started to adopt this on all of my WordPress sites. Um, you can do some of the things that it does manually if you, if you want to. Uh, this, this works for whether you're on WordPress or just a regular site. So one of the things you can do to add gzip is to uh, add it to your HTA access file, assuming that you're using Apache. Uh, another way is to add it to the top of your PHP files, assuming you're using PHP. And so this particular code uh, will, will do that. And, and don't worry, I, I, I have links to information after this in case you obviously can't write this down really quickly. Um, and then once you implement gzip, whether it be through a plugin or through HTA access, uh, or adding it directly to the to the top of your PHP file, uh, then you can test it on. Uh, this is a site I like the best to to go test things on uh, to make sure it's actually working because you can add those things a lot of times and they actually still aren't working. This is the link uh, that I wanted to tell you about. If you go to this link, it's a really good uh, resource uh, that I found a while ago that will provide the example code that I gave you before for the different options of, of how to be able to implement gzip on your site. But this is a pretty much a standard. This is something all browsers support. It basically will compress everything from the server in transport and then and then it'll be ungzipped and uncompressed on your end. So the other thing related to this is using a content delivery network and something that's fairly new which is called HTTP2. And so here is an example of regular HTTP uh, protocol, which has to make calls to all individual items. This is a HTTP, HTTP uh, two, which pulls everything in simultaneously uh, in parallel, and so it's it's crazy fast. And and so we've been trying to move everything over to to two, and actually, you know, so should you. And and so the. Uh, the service we use that supports that now, because I'll, I would say probably still most hosting providers do not provide this option, uh, is Cloudflare. And we like Cloudflare. We actually are using that with our software and our marketing site, uh, mainly because it has so many options and it just works so well. And it has HTTP2 uh, functioning out of the box. Uh, it works as a CDN, uh, it has security, uh, features and then uh, they even have free SSL that you can use because uh, HTTP2 requires SSL uh, and so what's nice is that they actually have a free option if you want to uh, take that. So I even have some uh, personal blogs that use their free service which also includes a free SSL. So I, I definitely encourage you to check out Cloudflare because they're doing a lot of really great things um, around speed and uh, security. Okay, so this is probably my favorite topic. This is the one that I've uh, been pushing for a couple of years now at least, uh, and that is basically optimizing your images, and especially now for, for mobile. Now that mobile uh, has become the core focus search-wise for Google, uh, this is something that a lot of people, uh, agencies, in-house freelancers, are not focused on, and, and it is... Uh, it can give them an edge, particularly against their competitors, if they start doing this for their own site, particularly from a, a speed standpoint and even a, a UX standpoint. And so, uh, one of the first things I like to point out is that responsive images 
are not optimized images. And, and so uh, what that means is responsive images are when you basically, the image looks right whether you're looking on a phone or you're looking on a desktop, but it's the same image. That is not an optimized image. That is actually a large image that has been shrunk uh, to be able to fit within the browser of a phone, but it's still a large image, and that mobile device still has to download that really large image. So optimization is actually serving a different image. Optimization is serving an image that is smaller, um, but still looks the same, potentially, and we'll get into that. There is a new HTML standard called source set. And it is an attribute. It is something that you add to the image element when you have an image on your page. And this is great because before this particular attribute existed, you had to use things like JavaScript and, or some other kind of hack in order to display a different image for a different device or even a different screen. Now you can do it just as a standard using the source set attribute. And so uh, it can, it, what it does is it lets you pick a, a smaller image, it lets you even pick a different image, and it makes everything faster and even, uh, as I'll show you, a better user experience. So for example, if you were on a, a small screen, uh, which is usually around 320 or 360 pixels wide, then that's the size of the image that you would actually want to display. But with source set, you can also provide completely different images that, that fit the actual device that's accessing it. And so uh, a good example of that is right here. We did a study last year uh, on, on basically the most common issues that people have uh, with their sites. And we based it off of anonymous uh, meta-analysis data from people using our site auditor. And so when we created uh, particular uh, images for that, you'll see on the left side there's a much simpler version that is still readable and you can see on a mobile device, but on the desktop we took uh, liberties with that space and added kind of more graphics and did a different layout. Uh, but basically this is in the code, it's the same sort of image where it's calling from, but it goes, oh, you're a mobile device, well I'm going to show this one instead of the other one, and it shows it smaller and it provides a better user experience. So this is the, the image uh, code that we're used to. This is what we typically uh, use. So it's this image has the source attribute to our image and, and then usually the, the alt attribute. So this is source set. And so basically source set is an add-on to the existing image code. And source set essentially says, uh, hey, for a particular image, uh, I'm sorry, hey, for a particular uh, device screen width, show this image instead. So the first one, the one that we've always used, is our default, that cat.ping. However, the other one, uh, we'll look at the second one in source set, cat-medium.ping 640w. What that means is uh, for that particular uh, device screen size, show this image instead of cat.ping. And What's nice about this is it's not just the device width, it's also the actual resolution of the screen, uh, meaning uh, if it is a high DPI or ultra high DPI, you can actually specify that by 2x or 3x, and it will actually know to show that other image. It's that smart and it's just that simple. There's no JavaScript, it's just HTML. One of the, uh, there, there is fortunately a WordPress plugin for this. WordPress actually automatically does this for featured images, but it uh, doesn't seem to do it for the other images. Um, it may have been changed in 4.7, which came out about a day or so ago. I haven't tested that, but one way to, to actually uh, at least shrink the images, to change, to present different sizes to different devices automatically when you add images to WordPress is to use this particular plugin. However, it won't solve the issue of will it look good on a device. So all this will do is resize it correctly for the right device, but it won't actually um, you know, change it like the example I gave earlier where it's displaying the best image uh, for that from a UX perspective. So kind of continuing uh, on with images, when you approach images, uh, another thing that people aren't doing is, is they aren't 
reducing the size uh, from a compression standpoint. So it ends up that, that pings and even JPEGs, uh, even though JPEGs in particular are compressed images, you can compress them way further down than what they are, and a lot of people don't do this. And, and so, uh, and even how, even the type of images that we use aren't really being thought through. So for example, uh, simple images, people will usually do as a ping or as a JPEG or even a GIF. Um, however, if you have something that's actually really basic, something that doesn't have gradients, something that is not a photo, which has a lot of um, complex colors, and then what you should be doing is using SVG in, in most of those cases, because SVG is incredibly tiny and has been so supported by browsers for quite some time. Uh, most of the simple images, uh, in particular icons, logos, and so on, that I, I use on any site uh, are generally going to be SVG first, unless for some crazy reason I can get it smaller on a ping or JPEG. Uh, the other reason why you want to use SVG is because uh, you don't actually have to use the source set uh, example that I just gave. Uh, SVG will, uh, not only is it small, but it will resize uh, and look great on on any resolution and any high def screen because it's actually vector instead of, instead of raster. So for those pings and for those JPEGs, if you are on a Mac, then image optimum is what I consider it to be the best tool that you can use. It's free. Uh, it's a free, free, I think, even open source tool. Uh, you can download it. It's a really simple app. Anytime I'm, I'm uh, using images on the sites I'm doing, I run everything through this before I actually upload it to the server. If you are on Windows, another uh, free, and I believe, open source tool is called File Optum. And so you can go here and download that. It does the same thing. In fact, I think it actually does more. Um, Image Optum only does truly images. Uh, File Optum for Windows actually, I think, does music and PDFs and that type of thing. So it's a pretty cool tool. And if you're on WordPress, uh, it's not as good as those tools that I just gave you, but at the same time, it's still kind of automated. There is the OO image optimizer, and that is a plugin that you can use that as you add images, it will actually compress them for you. And then they even have, I think, a pro version that if you have a ton of images, they'll process them on their own server, and uh, that's a pretty cool feature I've used before on a, on a couple sites in the past. Okay, optimizing HTML for bots. So we have talked about finding and fixing and optimizing uh, different things using uh, automated uh, auditor. Uh, we've talked about uh, going in and uh, optimizing your uh, your site to make it faster and caching. We've talked about images uh, and how to how to optimize those for both uh, users and for speed. Now, what I want to talk about is the actual HTML that you use. Uh, even after you've done all these things, there's a lot you can still do with how you present the content within the context of code uh, to a bot. And, and so uh, it, it's really important because it, it truly is how you speak to a bot. And there are new standards, well they're not even new, they've been out for several years now, uh, semantic HTML standards that will communicate truly the context and, and what it is you're, you're trying to say on a particular page. Because the modern page today has ads and navigation and related stories and on and on and on. It has all these different things on there. And, and sometimes, depending on just how crowded a person makes their page for whatever reason, uh, it's not always obvious what the true main intent or, or context of that page is. And so using these semantic HTML elements, which are standards, we can reinforce and, and communicate that to a search bot what something actually is for sure. And so header and nav and article and also something called section and aside and footer, those are all uh, HTML standard elements that you can use to, to say what something uh, actually is, what its intent is. This is an example, a very basic example of what that would look like in HTML. And so for example, for my main nav, I encase it with the nav element. 
if I have advertising, if I have something that is unrelated to my content, uh, which is usually located in sidebars uh, in, in regards to WordPress, I would, put, I would say that that's an aside. That is not something that is related to that. Uh, if I want to be really clear about what's a header or what's a footer, then I would encase it with that too. And so we have the tools, and they're all standards. We have the tools to communicate our content to these bots, but a lot of us don't use them. It's not just because this is the way you should put things together. It's also because these things do get read and can influence to an algorithm what something is and what something isn't. There is a full list of these at this link. Uh, I think it, I just linked to one of the uh, HTML standards body and it has a really nice list of all the different semantic elements that uh, I think you should be using. Um, and so kind of moving along as far as the code that, that you can uh, communicate, uh, I'm sure nobody is, uh, here you know, have, hasn't heard of you know, schema.org microdata. Uh, the reason why I bring it up in this presentation uh, is, is because if typically if you wanted to get something like this result, then you would have to use a bunch of what we call microdata into your HTML. And when this was first released, it was so elegant. <laughs> and, and, and I think the reason why a lot of SEOs and web designers thought it was elegant was because they could add this microdata into their HTML and it wouldn't change the way anything looked. And so that's why at first it seemed really brilliant. Uh, as time went on, it actually didn't seem that brilliant because you had to, it's really difficult to insert this kind of data all throughout your page, particularly when you're templating things. Um, it can get a little complicated and a little messy. And so I bring it up today just because there is a new and better way, and this is the, the now Google recommended way, which is don't use microdata anymore when you're using schema.org. Instead, the new way is JSON-LD, and, it's, and uh, not only is it more kind of compact and efficient, and it's something you can uh, put at the end of your page, it's something you can even uh, automate fairly easily now. And, and so there is a really great uh, tool uh, made by a company called Hunch Manifest called Schema App. And Schema App makes it super easy to kind of pick whatever type of schema that you want to include on your page and you just fill out the forms and then you can output it into whatever format you want. They have, uh, this is the link to their app. Uh, they have a, a free level and then if you end up you know, extensively using it, then they have a, a fee-based uh, you know, price. Uh, I really encourage you to check that out. That's, I, I am very, very impressed with what they have built. Um, they also make a plugin for it uh, that will allow you to add uh, schema.org data to your different posts and pages uh, using their plugin. And, uh, and it connects with their service. So definitely check that out. Uh, I, this was something that we were really interested in early on. We made our, sort of our own version of a microdata version. Uh, and then they, uh, once JSON-LD came along, they created this, and so we actually retired our schema creator for microdata, and I just push everybody to them with this, because I think it's great. Uh, this is something, for the past, I would say, a couple years, I have been encouraging people to do. This is, to my knowledge, this is in no way a uh, ranking factor, uh, although I think it might be in the future. Um, Throughout my career in SEO, one of the things that has always worked well for me in predicting the future has, has been where is Google going, what is it that they're focused on uh, now. And if I, if I would really think about that and focus on that, I would be right about 80 or 90% of the time if I adopted something even before it became public knowledge that they cared. Uh, in the case of Google, they care the most right now about mobile and UX. And so knowing that, I find any opportunity I can to, to actually identify places where I can optimize my site. And so this is one example where this is something where even if it doesn't become a ranking factor, you should be doing this anyways because it's going to be a better user experience for your users. And so it's, and it's really, really simple. And that is basically uh, inputting 
the, a, a special type, which these are all based, uh, again, off HTML standards, for input fields. And, and one of the reasons why is because when you do this, it displays a different keyboard, <coughs> excuse me, a different keyboard on the user's mobile device. And so if I do number, it actually gives me this keyboard that you see. And that doesn't seem really significant. It just kind of has switched from ABC to numbers. But it becomes more significant when you look at other ones. And so, for example, if I do type equals date, it's just going to be an input field today on a, on a desktop browser, but on my mobile phone, it actually brings up my date picker. And this works on uh, both iOS and Android, uh, all modern uh, uh, smartphone OSs. And, and then another example would be Tel. So if you're asking for somebody's telephone, don't give them the tiny keyboard. Give them the telephone input for that. So these are the little simple things that as you have people, it's already hard enough to fill out forms on a mobile device like a phone, uh, make it easier for them. And again, I, I, I will be shocked if down the road this has not become something that you have to do. Uh, but regardless, you should be doing it anyways to make your site better. So uh, there are several of these standard input types. This is the link to, to get those input types. So go there and, and please start using these for, for the sake of just regular users. Um, the last thing I'm going to go over is uh, preserving SEO through re redesigns and migrations. So we've talked about all the things we can do. Um, there, there was one other thing that we wanted to cover, which was uh, a lot of you end up, uh, particularly if you're in-house, uh, there might be a push for marketing or whatever to change uh, the site. Uh, if you're an agency, you might be taking over. Uh, a particular site or at least just doing their SEO. And so I just wanted to quickly kind of brush over some things to think about and consider when you're uh, in that position. And so the very first one is always fight <laughs> to make yourself part of the process uh, because you it'll be just uh, an uphill battle. It'll be an uphill battle anyways, but uh, even more so if you are just not part of the process to begin with. And Generally, these are the questions that I encourage people to look at and ask because uh, they're going to kind of help give you that roadmap of, of what your role is and, and what you need to look out for in that particular process. And so one of the first things is identifying top performing content because the last thing you want to happen is for that to somehow uh, disappear. Now, if it is going to be moved or disappear, you need to know about that so that you can make changes. Uh, uh, is the navigation of the site going to change in some way? Uh, for the Navigation is actually quite important because it is what is shown on every page uh, for the most part, depending on the architecture. And uh, how that navigation is done, whether, whether you're using text for that navigation, which I hope you are, and, and the keywords that are used within that navigation um, matter. And, and so you will want to have some impact on that. And is the design dramatically changing? That actually matters because if it is, they may be, uh, it may be very graphics heavy. And so you may need to address uh, the issues around that and make sure that the images are using source set, make sure that the images are compressed. Uh, and then who is coding the site because you would and should have close contact with them and influence to make sure that it is being done correctly to make sure that they are doing all they can based particularly on the things we just went over uh, to make sure it's being done um, the best and is the most optimized as you speak to search engines. So do not be, um, do not sit on your butt <laughs> and, and wait until the fires start to happen. Uh, back to sort of the fight idea, you need to be proactive. This is not something that you sort of go, I know I need to do this and I'll, I'll step in when I have a chance to step in. This is something that you need to do before the fact. Um, and, and then as far as at the very least of, of, of what you would be providing in that particular situation um, that you need to make sure that you're doing, uh, there, there should be a spreadsheet that you make that has all of the page, all, every page's metadata. That means the title, the description, um, any type of OG data, open graph data, whatever it might be, 
uh, that is hidden but important from an SEO standpoint, you need to make sure that you provide that with them so that otherwise they're going to be like, uh, you know, too late or we've already done it. Um, you need to give that to them uh, as soon as possible or beforehand. You need to list the speed requirements of the site uh, so that they aren't going and making this slow moving beast. <laughs> And, and so there, that means that you do some benchmarking of the original, you look at best practices and, and how fast things should be, and that's what you give to them. Um, if you are dealing with just a designer who just kind of puts stuff together or a lot of unknowns in regards to who's putting it together, then it would probably be in your best interest to put together code examples of how you want certain things done um, in HTML uh, and emphasize that it needs to be done that particular way. Uh, and then. So the last part is because you may not be the person who has access to the HD access file. Uh, and that is give them a list of 301. So if you know what's being moved or what's being deleted or whatever, uh, it's your responsibility to go to that developer, to that coder, and say, you know, before this is launched or when this is launched, we need to have these redirects in place because otherwise you may end up really hurting yourself in, uh, from an organic uh, uh, search result standpoint. So the last part is basically once it's done, the best you can do is, is monitor it and you, and you should be using Google Analytics or whatever analytics that you use. You should be using Search Console and, and use something like uh, our site auditor to make sure you know, nothing is breaking uh, and everything is working. So that, that is it. That is, it's a lot of stuff, but that is the end of the presentation. And I encourage you to check out uh, our site auditor at this link. John, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, the uh, definitely um, a lot to take in there. Um, I think the audience can appreciate your Raven links, uh, giving them quick access to um, all those resources. Uh, and, and this is kind of off topic, but I, I don't see very many people using um, a URL shortener similar to yours. Uh, what, what turned you on to that? I just Other than being I, I ultra love, convenient. <laughs> no, I love the TLDs, the new TLDs. Um, I um, I have different. Uh, I, I just think they're kind of fun. It's it's weird because I remember when .info came into play and it was just so spammy. <laughs> it's, it's used by all the spammers, and and even Google kind of looked at a .info as spammy. I think for a period of time, uh, but then we've 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 had in the past few years just this plethora of new TLDs that are really fun and interesting and targeted. And in fact, you know, I know there's, you said there's like 50 or over 50% of agencies on here. I've seen a, a lot of digital marketing agencies uh, switch over to the dot agency uh, TLD. And, and so um, I just, I just like them. I, I like, I like this idea. I've, I've played around with even using dot email, which I actually don't recommend. Um, that didn't work out too well. Um, but I have played around with, with using a, a bunch of the new ones, and, and it's just nice to not have to be confined to .com, net, or org, and, and, uh, and to have your domain name actually uh, emphasize what it's for. Now, from an SEO perspective, nothing. I mean, I mean right. there's, there's, no, there's no exact match domain that, I, that you really are going to get from this. I mean, that, those are kind of the old days. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more of just... A preference. I think it's really cool <laughs> to, to 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 use these TLDs in different ways. What about uh, referral traffic? Do the recipients of that traffic do they see that it's coming from you? Uh, that's a good question. I'm just using a, a typical. I'm using something called um, URLs, which is just like Bitly, but it's an open source um, URL redirect. Now, if okay. if you want to actually track things, then I would I would add campaign variables to the link. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, well, the questions are pouring in. I am going to oh, send out a, a quick poll and uh, just kind of gauge the interest level of our audience here real quick. So take a moment, everybody, if you would, uh, just let us know if you're interested in hearing more directly from John and uh, the people at uh, Raven Internet Marketing Tools. Um, let us know if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Page One Power Services. We do a lot of link building around here, among other things. And uh, um, 
or not at this time. Just uh, feel free and answer those questions, pop them in. Uh, love to hear from everybody on this. And um, your feedback it helps us with future webinars, um, so we appreciate you participating. Um, just a few more seconds on this poll, and then I'll shut that down. And good. Thanks again. Um, so I'm going to go back to the beginning. We had questions coming in the whole time. Uh, and so the first question from John, uh, he's just wondering about, you know, what as far as what Raven offers, uh, do you have a free version um, or a, is it a trial situation? Yeah, well, so we have two products. We have a platform, which is more uh, – what we call marketing reports that typically agencies will use. And then we have the one I was sort of mentioning today, which is our standalone site auditor. And that has a free account, uh, which is basically an account that won't end. It's, it's, uh, it's limited as far as the amount of pages that you can crawl, but it's a full featured account. Um, just You just can't crawl a really giant site, but you can get a full taste of, of, of how it works and the type of problems and optimizations that it finds. Uh, and, then, and then essentially, uh, it starts at $27 for a site, so you can, um, if if you're like, oh, this looks great, and this is, I like the way this works, then you can upgrade to what's called a, a start package, and then it kind of goes up from there, and all the way to a, a pro version that lets you do unlimited sites and just a ton of pages. Nice. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Joey, he comes in um, a little bit more regarding your presentation. Um, he's asking whether a caching and compressing is needed in a, this is a site that would be managed, um, a GoDaddy site managed uh, through WordPress, um, because he says most caching plugins are not able to be used with with that. Uh, I don't understand the question 100%. I, I think I do. I think I, I, a little bit. I, I think it might be that they're saying that they can't use it with somebody like a GoDaddy. That might be what oh, okay. it is. And, All right. And, and really, I would... This is so. This comes up a lot. Uh, assuming this is sort of the angle uh, that this person is coming from, um, the your your in most cases your livelihood, the the business itself is the website, and 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 so what I always like to I like to turn it around and be like, do you want to be, do you want basically the home of your company, the 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 entity that is for a lot of people, their business to be on the cheapest <laughs> and and shared hosting with a bunch of other people who you don't know. I mean, is that really the direction you want to go? Or or, or do you think it's a, a, probably a better idea to spend a little more money and, and, and maybe have your own virtual private server or even have your own co-located server uh, that's not shared with anybody that allows you to do all the things that you need to do and have full control over the optimizations that you need to have. And, and that, that's kind of how I usually approach that. And it, and it might be that, you know what, this works for us. We don't need to do anything. And actually we've been, you know, for some people, uh, a shared hosting environment that is cheaper where they're limited with the things they can do actually is just fine. But for people who are ultra competitive and, and, want, and need to have that extra edge and need to have control, and do all the type of things that, uh, in particular, that I presented today. I encourage you to to look into using a different hosting provider that where you can do all those things, or even in some cases they they come standard with with the service. Nice. Um, well, Aaron Thompson, he just wanted to share that the schema app looks awesome. I would agree with Aaron on that. Um, and then. Uh, uh, Joey comes back with another one. Is there a way to preserve SEO when you're changing the domain names but keeping everything else with the site exactly the same? And, and I've heard that question come up a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the general rule of thumb is that you might lose some, degree, you know, percentage degree, whatever you want to call it, of, of page rank. But if you essentially just switch a domain and, and redirect it, um, that's the best you can do. <laughs> I mean, right. and we're assuming that there is there's the reason why you're doing it is a branding change and and not because the the domain's been deemed 
you know, are penalized by Google. I mean, that's a whole other story. But if, right. if it's really just a, a branding change, then, you know, you just do it. And, and, there, and there's two things that you do, uh, assuming that you do the switch correctly and you redirect everything correctly, there's really only two things to do from there. Um, and that is basically to uh, continue to, to try to bring good exposure and add good content and get new people to link to you. And the second thing being, uh, I would actually consider spending the time to go back to my best backlinks and just, and just let them know that you changed your domain and if they could update the link. I mean, you know, in, a, in the most non-spammy, honest way possible. I, I, would, I would reach out uh, and just have them kind of change the domain. But, but beyond that, I, I would just keep doing what you're doing if you're doing it right and, and not worry about it. And yes, you might experience some lower um, sort of organic visibility at first, but uh, you know, if you're not doing anything shady and there were no penalties to begin with, you're going to be fine. Yeah, um, great tips there. Uh, and it is a situation that comes up with companies that, you know, do, they just get to that point where uh, for maybe reasons beyond their own power that they do rebrand and have to change that domain. That's, and that's a big move um, that would, uh, you'd want to just make sure that everything was, all the ducks were in a row before you uh, turn that on. With, uh, we've got a question about JavaScript from Svi. He asks, is there a WordPress plugin that integrates JavaScript into the body of pages? Um, that might be... He oh, yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, there is. And, and that, there, there's, some, there's a plugin I've used for many years called Header Footer. And that will, that will insert into uh, what it says, the header and footer. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and you can control if it's the whole site or certain pages or post or, or whatever. Um, so that's one way that you can do that from um, without having to alter any templates. You can do that directly from the WPA admin area. Um, Scott comes at us with a question. Uh, he's... He's wondering what's the best balance of in-house uh, or agency work being done during migrations and redesigns. I'm not 100% on the context of that. Uh, Scott, feel free to to add some uh, clarity in the questions tab. I mean, it's 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 a it's a hard question to answer just because every single situation is going to be different for each agency or in-house person or third party they're using. I mean, in other words, there's always going to be who's doing what is going to be an issue, um, and then politics and everything else. And and so that's why I, I kind of stayed kind of high level on that last section um, and, and, and focused on the most important things, as in, um, you know, the, the job of the SEO in regards to that is going to be, uh, one, do it yourself if you can. <laughs> or two, if you can't do it, make sure people know it needs to be done and, and they know how to do it. And, and so that, that's the simplest way I can answer that is um, you, if, you, if you're not doing it yourself, do whatever you can to insert yourself into that process and at least have it communicated because it's, it's, uh, at the end of the day, it's going to come down on you. At the end of the day, if, if the organic traffic just completely tanks, um, they're going to be like, what the hell happened? And and they're going to be looking yep. at you. And if you did nothing <laughs> up to that point, well, then, you know, your job might be in jeopardy. Exactly, yeah. Um, you know, we've got uh, a great question here from Cameron uh, regarding the JSON uh, that you were talking about earlier. He's, he said he makes note that you mentioned it should go in the footer, and um, he thought he saw another presentation that said it should go in the header. Any clarification there? Uh, not really. I would just have to look it up. I mean, I've certainly been wrong before <laughs> on, on many things. Um, I don't think I'm wrong on this, but but it, you know, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to see who said it and why they said it, and um, you know, even I've I've been doing this long enough that I've seen Google say certain things, and to find out that after the fact it wasn't true or they were mistaken, and you know, I I really don't know. <laughs> I, I think I'm right, but I may not be. Um, here's a question that is very, I guess, uh, 
elemental. It comes from Susan, and you know she thinks it's a dumb question, but I think if you're getting down to the basics of mobile versus desktop, it should still be something that is uh, talked about, and that is, you know, you have to build a rebuild an entire website for it to go on a smaller device, and I, and I think what she's getting at is, you know, the old mobile re redirects. Uh, where it would change the domain slightly, but uh, um, most people have gotten away from that now um, after algorithm update last year, last April 2015. Uh, what, you know, I guess, I guess uh, to rephrase the question, you know, what's the best structure for converting desktop to mobile? Um, by converting still putting on like a different subdomain or something else like that or literally just how do you go about it I mean how do how do I change this into that is that kind yeah, of the question yeah. that last part um, so I mean really what I typically will do my very my starting point is is to pick the right framework and by that I mean uh, HTML uh, CSS JavaScript framework and so Bootstrap is something that a lot of people use. I personally recommend uh, Zurb Foundation. So it's Z-U-R-B Foundation. Uh, it's in its sixth version now. Um, that, to me, is the absolute best mobile-first framework available. And it's free, and it's open source, and it's awesome. Um, that's what I build everything on now. In fact, we're about to um, release a completely new UX for our site auditor, and that's that's going to be built on on Zurb Foundation too. And I, I hand coded it myself. Um, the and then and then what you want to do is now that you start with that and you get familiar with how to use that, then you I mean that's you basically you build out you either build out your old site on that on a on a you know de dev or staging server or or on a, on a local you know thing on your computer. Um, or you make a new site. <laughs> I mean, you truly make a new site. But uh, you know, in most cases, the design is, is not hindered by the framework. Uh, you can you can take an existing design that's desktop only, and and uh, and recreate that on a mobile first framework. The the thing that the mobile first thing does is it provides you with classes that present different views. So for example, uh, with, with Zurb, it has a column system. And I can basically say, hey, you know, show this on a desktop in three columns. And then I can say, uh, on a medium size, on a tablet, or on a phone, show it as one column or two columns. And, and then and essentially, you, you kind of test it in those different views. And then you tweak the content based on that view and so you and you can do this by either resizing your browser or the even better way which is to use something like Chrome's dev tools which will allow you to pick even the all the way to the device so for example um, in the stuff I've been working on recently I'm in Chrome and I I'm in their dev tools and I say show me the view of this site I'm working on on an iPhone 5 and it gives, and it basically renders it in those dimensions, and then I can make tweaks and changes to make sure that it looks correct. Now, in some cases, there's just no way to perfectly translate all of the content or the page elements to a mobile view. And so, again, with with these particular frameworks like Zurb, they have classes that enable you to do some really cool stuff. So, for example. There's a class that's like something like show for small only or hide for small only, and uh, wherever I can apply that to a particular piece of text, to an element, to a whole paragraph, to whatever, uh, and it will show it or hide it for uh, if it ends up being on a small phone screen. So it's it's they're very simple but very powerful uh, tools, uh, which are really just come down to CSS classes that use within that framework. And and you can do a whole lot with it. It ends up it's it's it can seem a little overwhelming at first, but once you kind of start using it, and you kind of get in the groove, um, 
you're, you'll be like, I don't know how I lived without this. This is the easiest way ever to build for mobile, for tablets and desktop. Um, and you just kind of bang out conversions and bang out new sites um, after you kind of get used to it. Nice. I, I appreciate the detail on that answer. Um, and it's still something I think that companies and uh, website owners are, uh, you know, the big the big recommendation from Google came with that algorithm, you know, uh, they were, it was kind of a doomsday that people were just saying it was going to ruin your site if you didn't get it ready. But uh, I think there's still some slow um, progress in optimizing for mobile that's taking place and, and people are learning as they go. Um, I loved your, your tips on uh, input data as, as far as like specializing it to like the telephone keyboard. Uh, when I when I use that on a website, it's fantastic. I Agreed. Notice it, I notice it right away. It, it's yes. one of those things where you're just like, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to finish up with one last question from Heather regarding uh, speed. And she asks if switching to a desig designated hosting uh, will increase site speed. So uh, it, it it depends on who you go with and I mean you know it always depends on on who you're using and, and what you're using but I I have tested and tried everything over the years and I have for my personal use and even for our company have have moved to one hosting provider that is has been very reliable and is very fast and then in, and in both instances for for both company and my own personal stuff, uh, I have a dedicated server. And, and, and yes, I have seen an improvement over speed because of the fact I'm not sharing uh, a server with anybody. So there's nobody who's taking up resources. Um, in fact, the only person I'm competing against is myself, depending on if there's a particular site that might be doing that. But, but in the case of that, when you're on a shared hosting provider, you could have hundreds and maybe in some cases thousands, I guess, of sites on one server. Uh, and in the case of having a dedicated server, it's it's you and maybe you have one to twenty sites max. Uh, and and so it, it just kind of ends up being obvious as far as the amount of resources you have access to. And then, but again, the second part is make sure you pick a good hosting provider. I'll just throw it out. I I have been using a company called Pair who's out of Pennsylvania. Um, they've been around forever. I, they're great. I've left them, come back to them, uh, and I've been with them for probably a decade now um, for my own stuff. But there's plenty. I mean, there's so many. I mean, it's a, it's a huge market. Um, I mean, I don't even know if, if you guys mind saying who you guys use at all with Page One Power or whatever, but, but anyways, that's, there's a ton of really good ones. If you're only doing WordPress, you might want to use WP Engine. I mean, we've used them before when we only wanted to use WordPress, and they're awesome. There's just, there's so many good hosting providers. If you just talk to some colleagues, talk to some people within the industry, and, and get some recommendations, and then just go with it. You know, um, I don't. I I'm not a, a behind the scenes kind of guy. <laughs> so the details <laughs> of Page One Power's website were hosted on, through HubSpot and. Uh, we are our server. We've got a lucky enough um, opportunity to be connected to a fiber optic line here in Boise, like nice. right into the Time Warner pipe. Yeah. So we don't have to deal with the residential, like the slow cable and DSL stuff. But uh, what do you see coming down the line with more fiber uh, being put into the infrastructure? Do you see? Well, that I mean, helping. I see. I, I see fiber helping on the consumer end. Um, you know, it's it just means it's faster for you. You know, it's faster for us at home or at at work because we have fiber. You know, Comcast at work, and yeah, that enables us to have this nice conversation without it being all choppy like it is a lot of times. You know, with different connections. But you know, most good hosting providers are going to have fiber, um, and they're going to have a you know they're a good one's going to have a great connection. And and really, you know, to go back to that original question. I just I don't recommend shared hosting. I mean I just don't. If yeah. if it's if if it's important to you and 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 you don't want that to be a reason for slowing down, you know, don't do shared. Um, I mean it's not to say that you can't use shared 
and it can still be fast. I just am unwilling to take that chance. I mean, I've, I've had too many bad experiences and have known and had clients in the past that have had bad experiences. I just don't take the chance anymore. Well, John, I, it's been a pleasure to uh, um, learn from your presentation today, and I encourage the audience to uh, reach out to him on Twitter if you have any extended questions, at Raven John, or about the product, go to at Raven Tools on Twitter. Um, any, uh, any closing remarks for the people? We still have about 50 people holding in strong. Um, yeah, that's great. I really appreciate everybody staying this long. Um, I think that's great. I'm glad you, everybody's interested. Um, I would, uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I would say uh, I'd really, if I were to just pick something out, and this is more of a passion project, you know, a passion thing for me, I'd really encourage people to look into the source set thing. I, I think there's some interesting things you can do from a presentation and, and content marketing standpoint, um, and and then from a, a speed standpoint. We if you go to if you go to our just our site, if you go to raventools.com, uh, uh, that entire thing is hand coded and static. Uh, it's not on WordPress or CMS. Our blog obviously is, um, but and just see how fast it is. Because if you go to the site and you even just navigate some of the pages, it should be stupid fast. And it's because I'm doing all the things that I talked about in this presentation. It, and, and so it's just an example of, of what you can do. And I encourage you to look at the source code and, and, look, at, and look at what's going on. And, and source set is one of those things that, that we're using. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting if you access it on your phone and you access it on your desktop and you'll see that it's still you know, super fast and it's delivering different images. Um, without anything slowing down. It's basically AMP without AMP. <laughs> awesome. Well, John, uh, um, just, just want to say thank you. Appreciate your time and joining us today. And to the audience, uh, appreciate your, you know, taking a break out of your day and tuning in to, to listen and, and learn as well. Um, take his advice. Go out there. Be challenged. Uh, get... Um, you know, pick one thing and go after it on your websites and, uh, you know, see if you can track and measure those results. Um, get that one job done, come back and uh, go down the list. And uh, uh, from Boise, oh, yeah, Idaho, thanks for having me. what's that? Thanks for having me. I yeah. was going to say, thanks for having me. I had a great time. Appreciate Certainly. Um, from Boise, Idaho, we're going to sign off. Time to eat some lunch around this place and uh, we'll say goodbye.